And good morning. It's time for the Mike Hewitt Show, brought to you by Renegade River and Spring Lake. And here is your host, Mike Hewitt. Hey, good morning and Happy New Year, everybody. I'm trusting everyone had a had a, a good, uh, excellent uh, Christmas, Merry Christmas, in fact. And now we're on the verge of heading into a new year. Somehow, that's always pretty significant for me. Listen, before we get going, a little bit of a little bit of um, a housekeeping. Um, please visit us at the MikeHewittShow.com. We're also at Mike Hewitt forward slash, I'm sorry, Facebook.com forward slash the Mike Hewitt Show and on Twitter at Talk Mike Hewitt. Phone in number today, if you'd like, is 231 830 3109. We're on iHeartRadio.com iHeart right now, and the show will be replayed at 11 o'clock this evening if you miss any, bar, any part of it. Listen, in the studio with me is Matt Wiedenhoff riding shotgun. Matt, welcome back. Good morning. And our guest today on the line with us is Brigadier General Ernie Adino, retired. Uh, Ernie, if I recall you, or General, you, if I recall, you re- spent 28 short years with the U.S. Army? Yeah, 28 plus uh, four more at the Academy. So that's that's enough time. Thank you very much for your service. Well, thank you. We've got a great country. It makes it all worth it. Um, we, we, we absolutely do, and it's because of folks like you. Listen to folks, we... Um, General was on the show back midsummer, as July or so, I think, and I really wanted to end this year with you. And I appreciate you appreciate you joining me on such a big holiday um, today. But what what I wanted to do, though, when I look at the world, I've, obviously as we go forward, I'm looking for a security blanket, maybe. But it seems like there are sparks of fire all over the globe, um, at, certainly in the Middle East, and with what's going on in Russia and China scares me, etc. I know you spent a, a little over a year um, uh, uh, embedded with the um, Peshmerga forces. Am I saying it right? Yeah, the Peshmerga, the, the Kurdish fighters, which, by the way, that's a Kurdish word that translates literally to those who confront death. Well, I, as I understand it from from our, our conversation back at the summer and then also from a good friend of mine who uh, served in Iraq, he... He believes, and I think you kind of alluded to, that they are just incredible, fierce fighters as it pertains to um, defending, frankly, their independence, but everyone's independence. Am I am I saying it right? Well, you absolutely are. You know, when you when you when you get a chance to meet or live with the Kurds and get to know them very well, the first thing you realize is they're very much like we are here. They share some very important values with Americans. It, it, is, it is phenomenal and really heartwarming to see it. And when I, when I say values, I mean values of, um, of humanity and decency and um, freedom and um, free market and uh, democracy. It's, it's a wonderful thing. And, you know, it's still not perfect over there yet. It, it, the Kurdish region went through real hell on earth, and they have ris- they have lifted themselves out of the ashes of real genocide, folks. They have seen how evil evil can be, and they're determined never to go back to see that. And so right now, you see what they're doing to oppose and crush the ISIS advance and, um, and uh, much of the... Uh, some of the support inside Iraq for it, and also inside Syria. Some of some of the frustration I'm I'm going to guess you share. I certainly do. We we have I've had Doctor Abbas um, on the air here a couple times, and I, I think you know him. He's the president of the 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 Kurdistan National Assembly of Syria, and reading reading the planks of of what that organization supports, I kind of teased him, but I was serious. It looks like Thomas Jefferson wrote it. And, and what, what I find so frustrating is about the direction maybe of our own government, because when we are looking for moderate, moderate Muslim voices and we're looking for friends and allies in that region, there's no better friend and ally or moderate voice than, than what I'm seeing from the, from the folks that are the, the Kurdish folks. Um, yeah, I, don't so, dis- I don't disagree with you, Mike. I, I absolutely agree. I, I I find it fascinating that when we're trying to avoid boots on the ground in that area while while still winning a war with ISIS, and it is a war from my definition, um, I, I, that we're not, frankly, that we're not uh, 
Uh, it almost looks like we're pushing the Kurdish people away rather than embracing them. And, of course, I'm a layman here, and I, I'm looking for your direction, but I am I right that that's what we're doing, is pushing them away rather than helping them? Well, there's been a history of betrayals of the, the Kurdish struggle over the years. And, and sadly, um, and I'm just being honest here, the United States has been involved in some of those from time to time. Still, you know, we do consider, well, I certainly consider, many of us do consider the Kurds our best allies over there. No American has died at enemy hand on any Kurdish-controlled soil inside Iraq ever. That is a fact. You will not see that anywhere else inside Iraq. But there's this strange underlying, I don't know what it is, this angst amongst many here in the United States, and, 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 and I'll be honest, many of them are inside uh, our State Department, trained as classical Arabists with very little access to Kurdish histories, Kurdish issues in the English language, and so it's not terribly surprising to me that when they craft courses of action for the Middle East, they take a heavily Arabist perspective. But there's this angst that a strong Kurdistan will be destabilizing. I'm, I beg to differ, my friends. I, I, you know, many of the folks that you talk to will say, well, you know, you got to worry about Turkey. Yeah, you just, you know, you, you can't generate a strong or, or, or support a strong Kurdistan because that will generate um, some problems with Turkey. Well, you know what? That really hasn't happened in the recent period. What has happened instead is, as the Kurds have lifted themselves from the ashes, and, and, and developed um, trade with Turkey. Turkey has become the largest single investor in the Kurdish north of Iraq. That's number one. Number two, the Kurds are trying to export some oil across the Turkish border. That's a very wise move, move for them in many ways. And what that has done is that has been a tremendous unifier right there. The Kurds have a stake in that oil, and the Turks have a stake in that oil. So um, that has been a unifier. Now, there's, you know, this is not a perfect marriage, by the way, but it's a practical reality that we all have to be conscious of. I, cer I certainly try to keep abreast of that. When I look back, and I'm, I'm not a historian, but when I look back, I can't find any example in, in, in at least recorded time where the Kurdish folks have been our enemy, and I can't say that about any of the other popular in that in the Middle East. <laughs> so I think, wow, this isn't this isn't just a, a momentary, you know, moment in time where they where they're seeking our ally. They've always been seeking us as an ally, um, and they, as far as I can see, they've already always have had a classical liberal approach to politics and religion, which. As a Jeffersonian, I I greatly appreciate it. One of the it's probably one of the reasons I've I've latched onto this. But listen, General, I found a quote from you. There is a will to defend humanity that saturates the Kurdish population. Um, you, you, that was your words, correct? Oh yeah. Is, yeah. is that something you still you you still hold on to those? That as a truth? Yeah, it's not more. Yeah, but it's um. When you look back, where are we at in the fight, or where are they at with the fight with ISIS? I know I'm I'm just reading different things that you said. Back in July, you said the Kurds are closer than ever to independence, but I also find a few airstrikes don't win wars. And as I mentioned, I think the, it is a war with ISIS, and so I'm wondering, uh, how are they faring out in that circumstance? How has 2014 treated them? Yeah, well... As a uh, quick update, I would say the current situation right now in the Kurdish region of Iraq, the federal region of Kurdistan, you know, they're in a period of 48 hours, uh, roughly last week sometime, the Kurds seized back from ISIS 700 square kilometers of terrain that ISIS had gobbled up in those initial days of their, their advance into Iraq. And by the way, that wasn't as that was as much a a Sunni Arab uprising as it was in ISIS advance. So there were there were and still are various um, camps and demographics within inside the Sunni Arab demographic 
that are very supportive of ISIS. Um, and we have, to, we have to keep that in mind. It's also a bit of a strategic weakness for ISIS in that uh, as ISIS begins or tries to extend beyond areas that are dominated by Sunni Arab uh, populations, they begin to lose their effectiveness. They begin to distance themselves from their own center of gravity. So, um, you know, the ISIS push, if you will, into Iraq has been largely through Sunni Arab areas. Um, anyway, so the Peshmerga have seized back 700 square kilometers. That was just in a 48-hour period last week. That's on top of rolling back um, the ISIS penetration in many of those, I'll call them crust communities, kind of out on the, on the frontier. They have um, it's back under Kurdish control for the most part, and they broke the siege on Sinjar. So the Yazidis trapped on the Sinjar mountain complex now have, uh, have, a, uh, have a secure avenue to, to get off the mountain, get, get, aid, get, get aid to them. The next big um, operation, in my opinion, and I stay pretty close with uh, some key Kurdish leaders over there, uh, is probably going to be to, to seize the actual town of Sinjar now, which is pretty, pretty, wide, pretty much um, vacant of Yazidis, of course. They're all up on the mountain. So I think that's next. Um, but here's another reality. They've been doing this, Mike, almost on pure will alone. They have not been well-equipped for decisive op offensive operations. When I was there embedded with the Peshmerga for that year, uh, part of what I was there to do, and my teams, was not just to be there and operate with them on the battlefield, but to help help equip them and help train them and, um, and, and also be a link to U.S. effects. The equipping, however, was dramatically hamstrung by, um, by this fear of a strong Kurdistan. That's my, my assessment. We did not provide them the armored vehicles they needed. We did not provide them the artillery that they needed. Um, I couldn't get mortars. I couldn't even get sniper rifles for my Kashmarga. So right now, that sort of condition continues, and it's exacerbated by this strange logic that we are maintaining here in the United States to send any humanitarian or military aid intended for the Peshmerga through Baghdad first. And here's why that is very illogical. Mike, the Peshmerga, is they are the undeniable main effort in this war against ISIS. Call, anyone can call it what they want, and, and they, they may want to try to change the subject away from that, but that is the fact on the ground. We can all be very proud of that, but, but unfortunately, when we send gear through Baghdad first, instead of directly to Erbil, where it will then in turn go directly to the fighters, the trigger pullers that are taking the baseball bats to ISIS and shooting evil people in the face, it's going to Baghdad. But here's what happens. Baghdad has, uh, requires a manifest for the aircraft, i.e. What, what the air, aircraft is carrying. They want to review the, the manifest a week in advance. Anything on that manifest, Mike, that Baghdad, the body regime, by the way, Iranian-influenced regime, anything the body regime does not want in the hands of the Peshmerga gets barred from the manifest. And also... Of all the other remaining items, I can tell you from my experience, once that stuff lands in Baghdad, it is highly likely to get pilfered before anything gets in the hands of the Peshmerga. And that, is wholly, that is wholly inconsistent with sound military doctrine that would weight the main effort by, in many ways, but a primary way is by the allocation of key assets and key weapons to your main effort. This is this is illogical to me. My 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 fear, General, um, is uh, you know the the Peshmerga they're going to do whatever it takes to to for their people to survive, and if we are not going to be a player or um, a, a mechanism in helping them with that goal, then somebody else will, be it Iran, be it Russia or whomever, and 
it seems like we're taking a great opportunity to exactly stabilize that that uh, region and throwing it away by and almost pushing it to our enemies. Um, am, am, is my fear founded? Yeah, it is founded. Um, in particular, with with creeping Iranian influence uh, in the town of Jalala on the on the on the, the Kurdish border with Iran. You know, I used to call Jalala the last hundred kilometers, last sixty miles to a physically contiguous Iraq. And why is that the case? Because ISIS had pushed in, you know, all the way, almost all the way to Jalala. And it generated, in turn, a 1,000-kilometer border with the KRG, the Kurdistan Regional Government. That's a, that's a geostrategic reality that the Kurds have to deal with on a daily basis. And then there's Jalala, near the Iranian border. ISIS wanted nothing more than to get, get through the Iranian border. Well, we were responding with, to Kurdish military needs in and around Mosul and around the Mosul Dam, um, and I'm just talking about Iraq right now, not Syria. That's another matter. But, but in either case, the legitimate Peshmerga needs in and around Jalala largely went um, unheeded or unresponded to by, by this particular administration and leaving a military gap. Well, we're not going to fill it. The Kurds, they got to find somebody to fill it. And Iran was more than ready to step in and provide support. Um, so, so Jalal is in Kurdish hands right now, I'm happy to say, but there's a tremendous um, Iranian influence throughout the area. And so as Iran has near 100 percent influence over the southern 60 percent of Iraq that corresponds to the Shia demographic, um, how on earth does it make strategic sense to us to also see key portions of the Kurdish north now to increased Iranian influence. It just doesn't. I can't see why it makes sense, Mike. It's so, to me, to me, General, it's so counterproductive that it almost is as if there's a strategy that's not in the, not in American interests or Kurdish interests being put forward by by our administration. General, we've got to go to a break. If you would, please stay with us because I've got two sheets of stuff I want to talk to you about. Folks, yeah. we'll be right back. This is News Talk 1090, WKBZ. Be a survivor, not a statistic. Renegade River in Spring Lake has new and used handguns, hunting guns, sporting goods, and survival gear. Protect your rights and your freedom. Ask about their CPL classes. Renegade River, next to the police station in downtown Spring Lake. Mike Hewitt Show. My name is Mike Hewitt. In the studio with me is Matt Wiedenhoff. And on the line with us is Brigadier General Ernie Adino, retired. Uh, General spent a year and a half with the Peshmerga in Kurdistan and uh, 28 years in the U.S. Army, you know, four years at West Point. Am I correct, General? Yeah, that's correct, sir. And, and a whole bunch of education beyond that, I might add. Um, listen, what I, what I wanted to do, if we could, is, is segue just a little bit. I had a Facebook question or a couple questions from you from a, a gentleman named Sabah, if I'm saying that correct. Um, but first off, he wanted me to pass on a thank you. He says, hello, General, and thanks for your extraordinary service to the U.S. and your support for the Kurds. Uh, having said that, just so listeners know, this, this person is a U.S. citizen living here in the United States. Um, he writes, as, as we are witnessing the Iranian influence among the Shia and the Kurds uh, is expanding more every day. Uh, Turkey support for an element that we are not happy with and behind-the-door talks among Russia, Turkey, in Iran. He sets up, that was his setup for his two questions, or three questions. He asked, where do you think the U.S. position in that part of the world in general, and in the Middle East in specific, would be in the future? Um, I think he's as concerned as I am with, with our current policy, and I know you don't have a crystal ball, but what path do you think we're, we're on for this coming year? Yeah. Well, first I'd say this. Um, it's a you know, I don't know how else to describe it aside from an uncertain foreign policy um, with uh, with this particular administration. And you know, <laughs> uh, uncertainty uncertainty in a leader never inspires confidence. And so, 
it's, it's really no surprise to me if some of our uh, international partners are left kind of wondering if we're really in this for the long haul, wondering what we're, uh, what we're willing and able to do. And, uh, you know, I sense there's quite a bit of that, quite a bit of that unease out there. And, uh, and, and the Kurds have to be, the KRG has to be wise for that. But in one particular point, I think, um, I, I think we can have a very specific discussion, and that is about this pursuit of a nuclear deal with the United States, uh, with, with Iran. Um, we are pursuing that apparently regardless of cost. Now, that's my assessment. This is, an, this is a largely unpoliceable deal anyway but for some reason because we are pursuing it headlong we are unwilling to recognize the effect we are having on some of our really good allies like those in the krg so so what am i saying here because we are in pursuit of such a deal it seems we are very cautious about any potential sources of friction to that deal and one source of friction would be a strong Kurdistan, at least in the minds of, of the, this particular administration. And so when we have requests for aid, requests for arms, for what is undeniably the main effort in this war against ISIS, much of that is going unheeded uh, because we don't want to upset this deal. Now, the other thing, the other thing is this is a deal with Iran. We also support a unity government in Baghdad. Uh, okay, that is what near 100% influenced by Iran. The fact that we have a, a an apparent rising Iranian influence throughout the crescent in the Middle East and definitely pervasive inside Iraq is one of the key motivators for the support for ISIS from within Sunni Arab demographics across Iraq in particular, and in parts of Syria as well. And just to make sure I'm interpreting that right, what you're saying is that ISIS is the result of those folks pushing back against a rising, a rising Iranian influence. Am I saying that right? No, well, that's part of it. Okay. That is part. I think the other part, the other part is, has to do with, with identity and, um, and how you identify. And uh, it's not just about that. Shia piece, uh, the Iranian piece, but that is a large part of it right now. It's a complex motivation, but but the rising Iranian threat to Sunni Arab interests is certainly a key one. So our administration has adopted a single-minded, uh, um, a single-minded policy. Then, and one of the things that I'm I'm thinking about while we're having this to topic is Dr. Abbas, the president of the Kurdistan National Assembly of Syria had shared with me that, and, and listen, folks, not to, I'm not making a Democrat or Republican comparison and not a Bush versus Obama thing, so please don't take that when I say this. But Dr. Abbas's position was that while, in putting words in his mouth a little bit, he said while we didn't always see eye to eye on every issue with the Bush administration, the door was opened for conversation. And that has not been the case going forward with the Obama administration. And I find that such a frustrating thing for an administration to say we are open doors when, in fact, they're the exact opposite of what it is that, that history has presented open door really means. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's such a, to me, it's such a missed opportunity. Um, worse, we're, we're, we're invigorating and encouraging our enemies is my interpretation of this, of this policy of our, our administration has our nation on. Um, this same fellow goes on, he says, do you think that we are losing some possible long-term friends, i.e. the Kurds in the future? Do, and he's asking, I believe, is the Obama administration risking our long-term relationship with the uh, Kurdish people? Well, that's, yeah, that's a tough question. Um, it's tough for me to answer that one because I have such deep respect for for the Kurds and what they're they're doing, um, but you know, I look back over the time over over recent history with Kurdistan, and I got to say, every time the Kurds were knocked down, they seemed to come back 
um, still with great admiration for the Americans in particular. But, you know, each time there's also a bit of wariness. And, uh, you know, if, if, we, if, we, if we continue to um, snub some of the Kurdish key needs, you know, how much of that can anyone take, right? Uh, but there are some political realities and some geopolitical and geostrategic realities over there that would demand some U.S. engagement with them in ways we're not doing it right now. Um, and uh, let's just hope let's just hope we can change that in the future. Congressman Royce, for example, is trying. So he's introduced legislation that would authorize direct aid directly to Erbil, the Kurdish capital, and not to uh, Baghdad. Um, I would urge our listeners to support that in every possible way they can, write your congressman. We also need to support Kurdish oil exports, the right to export their own oil. Um, you know, Kurds are fighting a very expensive battle against ISIS. And, and, and folks, this is, a, this is a battle to defend decency and humanity. ISIS... Um, ISIS considers the United States and, and other other jihadist groups consider the United States as the far enemy. Osama bin Laden himself said that the near enemy were the secular Arab regimes inside inside um, the Middle East. Um, and there's there's no doubt that they have an intent to continue to expand. Um, and, and so and so in either in either case. In either, in either case, we've got to stay focused on what's happening over there and, uh, and, and, and help our Kurdish allies. They are a bastion of democracy and, uh, and freedom and many shared values with us in the United States. We can't continue to ignore many of their major needs. Here's, here's one quick example, Mike. I don't know how much time left we have. But we, we've, got a, we've got a lot of time, General, as much as it takes to figure this out. Yeah. Okay. So, so, you know, I am hearing from Kurdish contacts um, who desperately need armored vehicles. Um, I don't necessarily mean tanks, uh, because that in itself has some other uh, complexities associated with it. But vehicles such as um, MRAPs, the uh, mine mine resistant ambush protected vehicles. These are armored wheeled vehicles um, that are. Uh, medium weight, lightweight, let's say, as armored vehicles go. But they are at least able to give some protection to the troops as they have to cross open ground to close with and destroy the enemy. Well, I'm hearing from some some Kurdish contacts that there are about 250 MRAPs that are scheduled to arrive in Baghdad. Um, these are probably surplus MRAPs from um, our effort in Afghanistan or wherever else we got them. But only 25 are scheduled to go to the Peshmerga. That's 10% of the total. Now, if this is true, and I don't know that it is, but if it's true, that is inconsistent with sound military doctrine that would provide the bulk of the key assets to the main effort. And I assert that the Kurds, the Peshmerga, that's the, that's the main effort in this battle against ISIS. General, let me ask you, I'm, I, we're being asked on Twitter um, at Talk Mike Hewitt, a, a question is, is how close are we to establishment of an independent Kurdistan? And then, and then as a follow-up, he asks, has the drop of the oil hurt the prospect of a Kurdish state? Uh, very good questions, because I'll start with the second one. Yeah, the drop of the oil, um, the world oil prices has reduced the potential for... Um, some economic viability um, for the for, for the KRG. I hate to say that, but you know, let's be clear: Baghdad has withheld the constitutional 17 percent share of federal Iraqi revenues with um, the KRG for a year. Only recently, in the last month, has there been an agreement between Erbil and Baghdad. Um, to start to try to close that gap. Baghdad agreed to provide two chunks of $500 million to Erbil, but in exchange for 150,000 barrels of Kurdish oil on a daily basis. If that, was a, if that was a constitutional guarantee, there wouldn't have to be a quid pro quo. 
the Kurds would get their constitutional share. Uh, but that's not what has happened here. Um, Baghdad has has uh, leveraged the lure of this five two chunks of five hundred million dollars in exchange for this recurring delivery of Kurdish oil. Um, and so here we have the Kurds fighting a a very costly war against ISIS. They're incurring staggering humanitarian costs. The KRG is having to buy borrow money. And um, its ability to export Kurdish oil is is hampered um, by a refusal of, well, in this case, no, we, we bear some responsibility for it, too. We have not loudly, proudly, and unequivocally supported the Kurdish right to export its own oil. Let's get with it. That doesn't cost us anything to do that. We can do that, and the Kurds can start uh, selling some of their oil uh, freely. But oil prices... World oil prices are depressing the total amount of revenue heading back into Kurdistan. I got that part. That's that's a challenge. <laughs> yeah, that is a challenge. Um, all right, and so how close are we to an independent Kurdistan? Well, one, it's got to be viable, right? Right. Um, and as my as my friend Ambassador Peter Galbraith likes to say, independence, it's never a good time for independence. And he's, he's participated in <laughs> numerous independence efforts across the globe. By that he means you, you can't you can't wring your hands and try to roll up your sleeves at the same time over independence. It just happens when it happens. And uh, and um, the, the world eventually adjusts to it. Doesn't mean it's it's easy, doesn't mean it's simple, but it's just a fact that it occurs. Right now, what's happening with the KRG is they're taking a very deliberate approach to independence. Um, President Kurdish President Masoud Barzani uh, has made it clear and continues to make it clear that independence, sovereign independence, is the right of all peoples and the right of Kurdish people in particular. It's it's their in the end their determination whether they go forth with um, a move for independence or not. And most Kurdish civilians, most most Kurds on the street, ninety eight percent probably support sovereign independence for Kurdistan. But what, what Masoud Barzani has done is he's, he's gone slow with this. He's gone slow. Right now he's not making a priority of it. Um, um, he's got some other important things to address right now, like this fight with ISIS. I think as things start to settle down, um, maybe as relations begin to mature with, uh, with Baghdad again, um, this will probably pop back up. I think one thing for sure, the Kurds, when ISIS advanced and the Iraqi army withdrew out of those so-called disputed areas, um, or, you know, historically Kurdish areas, Kirkuk being one, the Peshmerga stepped in and filled the gap. All right, we can all be thankful for that. One thing that's not going to occur is I don't think we're going to see Kurdish withdrawal from those areas. General General Dino, let me let me pause you for just a minute. Uh, listen, I've got to go to a break, but I'm hoping you've got time to stay with us for another for our final segment because I've got questions popping up on both computers here in the station from different directions for you. Uh, yeah, we, sure. we, oh, great, folks! We'll be back in just a few moments. You're listening to News Talk 1090, WKBZ. Be a survivor, not a statistic. Renegade River in Spring Lake has new and used handguns, hunting guns, sporting goods, and survival gear. Protect your rights and your freedom. Ask about their CPL classes. Renegade River, next to the police station in downtown Spring Lake. Uh, Welcome back to the Mike Hewitt Show. My name is Mike Hewitt. In the studio with me is Matt Wiedenhoff riding shotgun. And on the line with us is Brigadier General Ernie Adino, retired. Um, General, when we left off, listen, I've got, like I said, I've got questions popping up on, on two different computers in here. But let me let me ask you one last one from a fella on Twitter. Um, actually, two. First off, he wants me to get you to tell us what your opinion is of Barzini, the the uh, the Kurdish leader currently. And you touched on him before the segment ended. But is this guy a great leader, a good leader, no good? What what's your assessment of him? He's a great leader. Now. He is uh, 
he is from a long family of Kurdish nationalists. The great uh, Mustafa Barzani was his father, <clears throat> and um, he's led. Uh, you know, Mustafa Barzani led um, um, led led the the Kurds uh, in their struggles uh, against Baghdad for many years. Uh, struggles struggles for independence. Uh, in the, you know, in early 60s, there was the, what they called the first Kurdish revolution. But prior to that, Mustafa Barzani himself um, helped the Kurds achieve their very first and only sovereign Kurdish state, the Mahabad Republic, in 1946 inside Iran. And it lasted for, sadly, about a year. You know, it said it lasted for a year, and there were, there were some some reasons why that lasted uh, only a year, and they actually had to do with the Soviet Union's withdrawal out of out of Iran at that time, and we don't need to get into it. But Masoud Barzani you know, is the son; he is the president of the Kurdistan Regional Government right now, um, and he is working diligently to a oppose ISIS and b create a strong Kurdistan. Independence, as I said earlier, is certainly a goal, uh, but he is not taking any, um, any, any, any hasty steps in that direction. In fact, when I was there on the ground in Iraq, um, there had been a referendum in the Kurdish region that was passed around. The respondents, I think the respondents were 96 percent, 97 percent in favor of a so sovereign, independent Kurdistan. But I had never seen any actions on the ground that would suggest the Kurds were trying to force that. Um, and I drew an analogy at the time. Um, the Kurds, because the Kurds know that pushing towards a hasty push towards independence would probably generate some real problems. Um, you know, they're very practical. I, the analogy I drew is, look, do I see myself driving a Ferrari, let's say, someday? Sure I do. But in the meantime, I drive a Jeep. And, yeah. <laughs> I like it, General. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So he's, he's working very hard to try to keep the, the parties, the Kurdish parties, unified. Uh, it's not an easy task, and uh, not an easy task at all. In, in, but he's working with it. In your opinion, if, if we allow, and I think that's the right word, if we allow Iran to win in Iraq, won't they then start looking at other other allies in that area and challenging us in those countries as well? Well, it just yeah, seems, I, seems to me like we've let the tiger off the leash almost on purpose. Well, there's a heavy, you know, there's a heavy Shia presence inside Saudi Arabia, as an example, and some of the other Gulf states. Um, and those, in, you know, Saudi Arabia has a real concern with that. Um, but here's the strange thing. You know, there's, there's an undeniable detente in the works, let's say, with Tehran, between the United States and Tehran. There's a rising tide of Iranian influence. And, um, you know, I've heard folks say, well, you know, a detente with, with Tehran is really not without historical precedent. You know, we've done it twice before, both with Moscow and Beijing. And um, in, in World War II, we did... did the unthinkable. We allied with with Russia, with the Soviet Union, but it was to oppose a greater threat, the threat threat of Nazi Germany. Later on, you know, when President Nixon opened to Beijing in the 70s, um, that was then to oppose a greater threat, a greater threat of a Soviet Union. In this case, we have Iran as the greatest power right now in uh, in in the Middle East, that, in the Gulf. That right? to me, that to me is a fearsome policy, on our part, yeah. for us to have encouraged or allowed that. Yeah, yeah but what we're doing, Mike, is uh, we're approaching a detente with them. But in this case, it's not to counterbalance a greater threat somewhere else. It's strangely to accommodate it. Iran itself as the greatest uh, greatest power in the Gulf. It's, 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 it's not at all analogous to the first two. Um, a a fellow um, up in Oceana County here in Michigan asked a couple things. One of the things he wanted to find out, and you touched on it earlier in the show, 
but there's a couple House bills that are floating through right now to allow some direct funding. Um, and in fact, he directed us to go to a website uh, as a great source as, I don't know how to pronounce this, but ruda.net, R-U-D-A-W dot net forward slash uh, English. He indicates that's a great source for looking at some of these topics that, th that we're discussing today. But, but more specifically, with the House bills that are floating that you touched on, you, do you, you see these as, as good things, correct? Oh, absolutely. I don't know. What, I, don't, I, I, I really hope the president will take the authority and act on it, if, you know, but... Uh, well, that, that was my... That, right, and that was my question, General. It, it, to me, judging from the policies we've seen in the last, now near six years now, I, I wouldn't guess that he would sign those bills if they made them to his desk. Yeah, well, that's, that's right. I'm, I'm with you on that. I hope he does. Well, one, of, one, of the th one of the things that makes it difficult to advance what I consider to be sound common sense policy is our media, because the media seems to flip-flop all over the place um, and not stay focused. So it, for most of America, it seems like the, the ISIS and, in, in, frankly, the Kurdish plight is like out of our radar now. It's no longer being discussed. And to, to me, that's as, as destructive as the Obama administration's policy is for trying to get aid and assistance in that region. That is a terrible development, Mike, because it is an absolute fact that the value of the objective determines the magnitude and duration any nation, or the magnitude and duration of a war any nation will wage in its pursuit. That's not me speaking, that's history. That is actually, those words were spoken by uh, perhaps the most influential military theorist, certainly in the West, Karl von Clausewitz. And if we as a country do not recognize the great stakes, the tremendous value in victory over ISIS, um, we, will, we will not tolerate a costly war in its pursuit. But if it's a high-value objective, oh my goodness, we'll, we'll wage a war of tremendous magnitude and duration in its pursuit because it's that important. And I was, I'm sad that I did not hear the president articulate the why this is important. You know, he kind of got into the how. That's good, uh, you know, but leave that part to the generals. What the president <laughs> needs to do, make the case why doing what we're about to do is so important. And, and Mike, uh, I'm with you. Uh, at the same time, we're seeing great support growing within uh, the U.S. population, at least sympathies for the Kurdish position, I'm still not sensing that we, we understand how important victory over ISIS is. A anyone, that, anyone that actually s looks into this, uh, to me it's just, it isn't ideological, it's common sense. But listen, not, not to take us too far off track, but I understand that you visited, and I'm going to say this wrong, I'm sure, but Halabija, am I saying that wrong? Yeah, Halabja, yeah. Halabja, okay, in 2005, right after a chemical attack. Um, is that, did, did you visit there then? Well, I did. Well, I, all of 2006, it was only about 25 minutes from my safe house. It was right in our brigade area. Some, uh, some, someone's asking me on Twitter, ask the general how he felt when he visited uh, the yeah. site after the chemical attack. Well, the chemical attacks occurred in 1988, um, March 16th, 1988. And uh, it was the largest chemical strike against civilians in history, and, and Saddam had launched. Um, well, he, had, he, had, he, 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 he started dumping a mix of nerve agents, blood agents, and blister agents. I don't think we'll ever know what the precise mix was on that, on that village, on that town. 5,000 Kurds died. <clears throat> Probably 20,000 were maimed. And if you go there today, you go there today, you will see a high incidence of, uh, of birth defects. You'll see many maimed people. Um, it's kind of a sad town, and it's, it's a sad town. Uh, it's set in a beautiful area, and um, and, uh, and 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 yet when I got there uh, my first time, you know I. I walked over to one of the, the mass graves there, and I met a man who came up to me. And, you know, he just 
we got talking, and he just said uh, you know, he had lost 18 or 19 of his family members. He was the last surviving member. And he didn't even, you know, he didn't even ask me to do anything. Like, it's sort of a common occurrence in, in uh, some, some other countries when they see an American, you know, can you help? And, and I, I expected it to hear it, and I didn't hear it. And it, it, that struck me like a bomb, as if this, this man was just even tired of hoping now. Um, that was very sad for me. Very part, sad. Part of, I, can't, I can't even imagine that, General. But, I, but, but listen, this guy, I think, sums it up on Twitter in terms of, of dealing with our, our blowing in the wind policy. He writes, he's... he's He's a Kurdish and evidently from Iraq, because he, he's in Iraq now. But he writes, I hope they don't let us down again, especially in our conflicts with central government in Baghdad. Um, we're, we're down to one minute. In, in 30 seconds or less, General, what, what can we do forward to try to save the circumstance and beat ISIS other than waiting for 2017 with new leadership in America? All right, real quick. One... The KRG is enormously appreciative and grateful for the aid they've been getting. It's been, um, you know, well, very well received. We've got to ramp that up. We've got to send more directly to Erbil and not through Baghdad. That's number one. Two, here are a couple of practical things we can do. The Kurdistan Human Rights Watch is a, is a great organization based in, in Washington, D.C. They are trying to help manage the humanitarian situation over there. Uh, please look them up. Um, Kurdnas, the Kurdistan National Assembly in Syria. That is an organization of very, uh, very modern Western, uh, West, well, Western loving um, Kurds. Uh, yep. Talk about when you want to talk about folks who are well vetted. These guys are vetted. These are the types of folks that can really help us find the right General, folks inside Syria. Yep. General, listen. Thank you very, very much, and happy New Year to you and your family, folks. Happy New Year, and thank you very much. We'll be back next Wednesday.